I'm Drenda and this is Drenda On Guard. Let's get into it today. We have the second part of a conversation with Bill Federer, who is an incredible historian, author of a plethora of books. We got on into election integrity and we talked about abortion. Will the person that aborts a baby also cheat in election? I don't know, let's get into it. We must stand up. There are answers and we've got to expose the darkness in the world so that we can be free. Self-made gods are nice things to have around until people actually start to need God. And that's what's happening in our culture. We need to do something. We need to say something. We need to stand up, be bold and courageous. You've got to stay on guard. I want to shift to talking about what's going on in the culture, an election integrity. My husband had a good conversation with you about uh, corruption in the culture. And I would love to just expose some of those things that you're seeing, the breakdown of our election system, the breakdown of, uh, you know, what we call law, the rule of law. What do you see? Yep. Well, the word electing, elections, electors, voting, uh, is mentioned in the Constitution and Bill of Rights numerous times. Never once does it tell how to have an honest election. It was assumed we, we had a moral population. Right. Even in 1965, 93% of Americans identified as Christian, 69% Protestant, 25, 24% Catholic, and then there were 3% Jewish. Wow. 1965, it was 93% Christian. So well, 62 prayer was removed out of school. There was a shift then it went that downhill. happened from there. Yeah, so now we're down to only 65% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Almost a 30% drop uh, since 1965. And um, and so the uh, we have a population with less morals. Right, and, and so in, in, in if, the UK, I saw a bill that they just had a new census that said only 46%, first time in UK's history, that there are less Christians in the population, that there are actually not at least over half the population. So we've seen Europe decline. Of course, only 4% go to church, even though 46% say that they're Christians, but that's their, the first time in recorded uh, current history that we can see that trend. So you were saying what's going on here is the same kind of pattern. Yeah, and so if you think of it, if if a party can put into their platform that they're willing to kill innocent babies, uh, what's voter fraud compared to that? I mean, you, if you can mentally justify killing a baby who has not done anything wrong, I mean, if you think of it, you would, you know, we use the phrase innocent as a newborn baby. I mean, it's like that's the epitome of innocence. Mm -hmm. And if they've not done anything wrong, and what's a just God supposed to do? If God does not judge us for killing innocent babies, then his silence would be giving consent to the sin. And if God wow. gives consent to one sin one time, he is no longer a just God. Wow. He denies his just nature. He denies himself. Right. And he's, he's not going to deny himself. He's holy. So he can't accept sin like that, right? <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's why, the, that's why we have the gospel. Because God's a just God. He can't change his nature. He has to judge every sin. In mathematics, you have equations with constants and variables. And so in the in the equation of redemption, the constant is God is just. He forever was, is, and forever will be just, mm -hmm. which means he has to judge every single sin. Yes. Because if he doesn't judge his sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. And if he gives consent to sin, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. Mm -hmm. And so the gospel is... He provides his own son to be the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Mm. So he maintains he's completely just, but he's completely loved that he provides the lamb to take the judgment. So the lamb is God's way to be able to love you without having to mm. judge you. Mm. So it, it doesn't change his just nature. Right. He's still just. He just provided right. a way for him to be able to love you and you love him without him having to judge you. Yes, that's beautiful. Right? I'm thinking and, of the scripture that says, I, the Lord, do not change. And he doesn't change. Know. His standards, people try to say, Christians try to say, well, that was cultural. Pastors, leaders 
that was cultural. Uh, we can accept LGBTQ. We can accept these things because our culture is different and God is love and, and God should let me love who I want to love. But God doesn't change and his word doesn't change. It's, it's yesterday, today, it's forever the same. But he provided the lamb. He provided the salvation we need as a, as a, as a sin of fallen world. He provided. Yeah, Jesus did not get rid of the law. He just paid the penalty for us right. breaking it. Yes. Right. And there's dietary law, civil law, and religious law. And so we're talking the religious law. But nobody's going to take God's name in vain in heaven, right? It's yeah. still it's a it's a perfect law. So nobody's going to kill in heaven. Nobody's going to lie. Nobody's going to commit adultery in heaven, right? Uh, God is still a pure God. Jesus just paid the penalty for us breaking the law. But He still is a holy God. With He's a God of laws. Yes. And and but with that. Uh, you're you we're putting God in a position yeah. and so it, where we've been killing innocent babies and if he's a just God and if he doesn't judge us for it he's giving consent to that yeah. so let's go back and there's a king Manasseh and he's wicked and he's yeah. sacrificing children to Moloch and the prophets come to him and say you are doing the same thing that the people that were here before Israel came and did yeah. and because they did it I brought Israel into judge them and drive them out. And because you're doing it, I'm going to drive you out. Right. And so judgment was pronounced. And so Manasseh dies, his son dies, but his grandson is Josiah, eight years old, becomes king, 16 years old, starts to seek the Lord. When he's in his early 20s, he tells the Levites to clean up the temple that his granddad had trashed. And they come out with the scroll, the law of God, that and jo Jeremiah and yeah. Josephus, uh, indicate that it potentially was the last copy of the law on planet Earth because Manasseh was destroying all the copies he could find. And the priests read it. This is something really special. They read it to this young king. Obviously, he had never heard it before. He rends his garments, mm. sends to a prophetess in town, a woman named Holda, the wife of the king's tailor, to ask what's going to happen. And she says, tell the man that sent you that judgment will come, but not during his lifetime because he repented when he heard mm. the words of the Lord. And so right now I'm speaking the words of the Lord, right? We're, if we repent. And so Josiah had this big Passover, supposedly the biggest one ever. And then he sends the Levites out to teach the law. And so during this revival is when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get saved, to use that term. <laughs> and, uh, and for the rest of the 31-year reign of Josiah, there was a reprieve from the judgment. So judgment was pronounced, but they repented and God put the judgment off. He didn't cancel the judgment. He just put it off. So he's still a just God. He's just putting off the judgment. Mm. And eventually it hit the fan with Zedekiah. Mm. And, he's making uh, and room so, for people to repent. Yeah. So if, if we repent, God can still be a just God and put off the judgment. And, mm. and who knows if it's the next generation repents, he can put it off. And ultimately, that's what the book of Revelation is for. That's for God to judge every sin he missed along the way mm. so that you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were this sin by way back when and you didn't judge it. Just no, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And the mm. angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Mm. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. Yes, and you're so right but, about if they are willing to abort a baby, then would they cheat in, a, a, you know, in any kind of a contest or you know is there election integrity well the fact that you would do the one is very clearly but yet the the media pushes this narrative that you're an election denier if you dare question the fairness which you've been talking a lot about the fairness of god that you know justice and what happens when we break the law but yet we see lawlessness in the culture and we see unfair uh, application of the law, a two-tiered uh, legal system. Uh, what do you see in the election integrity? What do you see going on there? And how do we fix these things? And should we challenge these things? And are we just wrong to think that there's possibly any cheating going on? <laughs> oh, there's definitely cheating. Uh, I mean, even way back in, um, in, in Lincoln's day, there was military ballots that were not being delivered because the commanding officer didn't like the way that the uh, people under him were voting. And uh, wow. there's the famous Lyndon Johnson running for the U.S. Senate in 1948 against the governor of Texas, Coke Stevenson. 
and it's a Democrat primary and LBJ loses, but they claim that there was found a box of uncounted ballots. Really? In Alice, Texas, Jim Wells County, precinct number 13, which happens to have been LBJ's hometown. And wow. the godfather there was George Parr. And by the end of the week, there were 200 extra names that were found to have voted. And they were all names from the local cemetery signed in in alphabetical order with the same handwriting and the same ink. Wow. And the FBI and the postal department was brought in and they verified it. And so then it goes to the Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black that tosses it back to the Texas Democrat Central Committee. And by one vote, they vote to back Lyndon Johnson. Wow. And wow. so it was so there's nothing new under fraud. the sun. <laughs> there really is nothing new. <laughs> yeah. And so Lyndon Johnson was nicknamed Landslide Lyndon because he only won by this slim wow. margin of votes. Wow. Uh, so it was a tongue in cheek. Um, but it was it, everyone. It, this is the Washington Post and the New York Times both admit that it was fraud. And yet he got in and um, wow. and after he got in as president, a whole lot of the records of the fraud were sort of uh, misplaced. So for anyone that does not think there's voter fraud, they're they're looking at it like a child. And I just say, God bless you. <laughs> you need help. Um, <laughs> but but human nature will without God, anything mm. will be attempted. Wow. Wow. So do you know, my husband was saying you share with him how they cheated. Uh, do you have some insight into that? Um, yeah. Well, you know, you uh, I have a degree in accounting. And so uh, we, we do audits and you look for potential conflicts of interest. For example, in Arizona, the person that's the secretary of state in charge of making sure the election is honest is has her name on the ballot to run for governor. Right. Anyone can see this is a conflict of interest. Right. That that if you um, uh, you look at the uh, different ways of um, there's no way to secure mail in voting. Uh, if you needed a ballot and you were going to be absent, that you would contact the board of election and say, send me a ballot. But just to have the government blanket send out thousands of ballots. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the American Thinker magazine had an article where all they did was tweak and put in the wrong zip code and 31,000 mail-in ballots went out but got kicked back so they never were delivered. And then that uh, were they, those were 31,000 ballots that they could forge and drop off. Mm. And who's going to be able to stop them once they're once they're dropped in that box, mm. uh, once they're accepted in the mail, they have to be counted. And there's and, no accountability. Uh, yeah. And these drop off boxes uh, that's there. They post on there. It's illegal to drop off any other ballot other than your own. Yet there are pictures of people with handfuls of ballots shoving them in there. Mm -hmm. And once they're in there, they have to be counted. Um, it, there is no way to secure that. What do you think so, about the paper versus the digital? Sorry, I didn't mean to stop your thought, but no, no, the, the, the digital is the easiest to do for voter fraud. Um, that when you, um, uh, when you, uh, you can either have accountability or anonymity, you can't have both. Mm. And, um, and so, uh, Staple Street Capital is the company that owns Dominion voting machines. Uh, Staple Street Capital is a private equity venture capital firm, which they're in business to make money. Right. So the accountant in me says, OK, uh, is there transparency? Who are the people that own Staple Street Capital? Um, is it um, are they foreign? Is it China? Um, do they have a financial interest in the right. outcome of the election? Right. I mean, you remember the stories of basketball games and they'd be betting on the games and they would go to a player saying, you better throw this game and lose it uh, or, you know, bad things will happen to you and your family. And, 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 and so here you have a financial interest. Do the owners of Staple Street Capital, are they all like monks and nuns and they don't want to make any money and they're taking vows of poverty and they just, you know, mm -hmm. they're really, really super honest. And, and if so, can we know their names uh, or <laughs> are they people that, have, could potentially have a financial interest. If they are, then here they 
are determining the elections in America and Brazil and around the world. Right. Um, there needs to be some transparency. At the very least, there needs to be random audits. Yes. You need to randomly audit elections because usually it's the loser that has to pay for the audit and the loser has spent all their money trying to win so they don't have it. So in other words, if they do voter fraud by large margins, then there's no challenge and then they they tell the people well you're an election denier you're a sore loser or if you're in brazil uh, if you you're wanting to be a dictator if you don't accept our voter fraud um and so they try to guilt trip you into okay. accepting the fraud so is there more motivation than just finances in these people state street capital and these people that are part of this it's staple street staple yeah. street i'm sorry um th there is a, a state street and, and BlackRock and Vanguard, and those are big private um, asset management companies that own control trillions of dollars. Uh, matter of fact, 80% um, of the S&P 500 companies controlling interest is owned by these three asset management companies, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. And, and I'm, I'm concerned they're making a monopoly to where no one can do anything without their approval, without them and free enterprise is going away and there is no freedom without free enterprise. Yeah, and, and they're pro-China, pro-woke, pro-globalist. Pro and there are people like Klaus Schwab of the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum, and he wants to have a global government. Right. And he it's what's called a great reset. It's an yes. orchestrated global financial crisis. Yeah, we've talked about a lot where, here, yes. Where you're, the dollar is, they, they Prints, they create so many trillions of dollars that the dollar loses its value. Mm. Other companies stop using the dollar. It, it loses its place as a world reserve currency. And then uh, when there's rapid inflation, that's when everybody goes to the government and says help. And the government says, okay, we're going to issue a CBDC, central bank digital currency. We can track everybody's purchases. We can uh, program the money so it'll be spent some places, not others. We can put a timestamp on it so it'll uh, evaporate if you don't spend it in time and we'll tie it with an ESG score, environmentally friendly, socially woke and, and governance. And so if you're not woke enough, your money won't work. Mm. Um, and, and basically it's moving in the direction of you can't buy or sell without the mark. Exactly, kind of exactly, um, Bill, that's what I, I see too. But I do know that if we repent, uh, mm -hmm. God can put, put all that on pause. Right. And, and it's happened throughout history. Well, we so, haven't seen that great revival, and I feel like the enemy's trying to shorten the time. But I feel like as a church, we have to speak up, step up, fight back so that we push back so that we can see repentance. We can see souls come into the kingdom of God. I mean, I'm thankful that Jesus didn't return before I got born again. And so we do need to not just say, oh, come back, Lord, but we got to get our work done, too. We got to do what we're supposed to do. And I believe that has to be pushing back evil while we, it's kind of like Nehemiah, you got to, build the wall while you fight the enemy at the same time, right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, looking at it from a different point of view, um, most guys anyway, uh, like a fight. Uh, I mean, it, you think of it, little kids play cowboys and Indians and army mm -hmm. soldiers and, and you want to play sports and you want to compete and you want to, um, uh, that's if, if we lived at a time when everything was done, all the diseases were cured, all the babies were fed, everybody knew the Lord, and you die, you're in heaven, and you're sitting around with Moses and Gideon and David and all these great prophets, and, and they're, they're all telling their exciting stories, and they say, tell us your story. And you go, hey, it was all done by the time I came around. <laughs> they're gonna say, boring. So for the rest of eternity, you'll be known as the boring story guy. Um, no, but but we get to say, no, let me tell you about when we were living, they were Ooh. killing babies, they were wanting to change their sex, they were wanting to do this. And I said, enough is enough. God used me to make a difference. Let I me love be your that. hands and feet, and love the unlovable, and rescue those unjust and sentenced to death, and, defend the defenseless and feed the poor and to clothe the naked. And, and, and so we, we need a purpose. Yes, we do. You know, I love they, that, Bill. They, I love that what you're saying because that is what fuels, it should fuel us to see these things that we have to, God's put the spirit inside of us to rise up and defend the orphan and, and take care of the children and take care and rise for our hour in this time that we're called to make a difference. Cause I hear a lot of people that are disillusioned. They're tired of fighting. They're discouraged. They're, I think we didn't have enough backbone, enough toughness, enough mental toughness, enough spiritual uh, stamina and enough uh, intellectual acuity, whatever we just, we lacked all of that. And I do believe that it is sharpening some swords and it's causing people to rise and, and get in the fight 
But I also see a group of people that go, oh, we're just tired, we're disillusioned. We're, you know, what hope do we have? We're just disgusted with everything. Our election system's broken, the FBI, the CIA, everything's going down the tubes. What would you say to them? What hope and what do they need to do? Because that's the thing. It's like, we can't just bellyache. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, well, God has something for each person to do. Yes. And it's up to each person to seek the Lord and then get involved. And there's need. Jesus says the poor you'll have with you always. In other words, there's, there's always going to be needs. And you let the Lord manifest himself through you. And so to meet the need. And, and so uh, there's there, there's always been crises. There's always been needs. And if we get through those crises, there'll probably be another one. Mm. We get through that crisis, there'll probably be another one. Mm. Jesus says wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. It's the human condition that there's mm. always crises. And those believers that are alive get to let the Lord use them to meet the crises, to do something about it. And if you already realize that you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God, you belong to him and and have faith that he's he'll have you here as long as he wants you here. And he'll call you home when it's time for him to call you home. And you just let him use you to meet the need. And um, and so he, he has something for each person to do. And, mm -hmm. and it's each one's unique and uh, and it's exciting. It and is exciting. There's nothing more fulfilling than, than letting the Lord use you. In your purpose. Um, to, to meet people's needs. and I know you're a man of uh, a scholar, historian, brilliant. Tell me what you think is going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to be a prophet today. What do you think is going to happen? Um, we won't hold you to it completely, but you've seen history repeat itself, repeat itself. You've given us an incredible amount of uh, background in the Bible and history in our nation and in culture throughout history, all the way Roman, Plato, uh, Bible history, American history. What do you think is going to happen? Um, well, God uh, loves us and he wants us to love him back. And love by definition must be voluntary. So he will never force us. But he does have plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses us so much we turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, there is plan B. Uh, the Deuteronomy says he hides his face and he lets us experience the consequences of our selfish actions. And then we turn to him out of desperation. Hmm. His goal is to have us turn to him. So all liberty is individual. All repentance is individual. And if the blessings uh, don't turn us to him, then there's plan B. He will let it get tough. But the goal is to have us turn to him. And so it's a whole lot easier to turn to him voluntarily, right? Uh, when things right. are good, it's, right. it fall on the stone to be broken or the stone falls on you and you get crushed. So mm. they better do it voluntarily. That's right. It makes me think of the book of Daniel too, about the kingdoms and the, the stone that comes and crushes all the kingdoms of, that man's tried to build throughout history. And he puts his kingdom as the mountain of the Lord that rises above all others and everything else is destroyed. Um, I know that there's, there's, we're living in a time that there's pressure. So you, you, you would say to the believer who is living for God and loves the Lord and who is speaking and doing what is righteous. I think of the scripture that says, tell the righteous, it will be well with them. So can there be judgment coming in our nation and on the earth and in governments and in lives of those that have defied God and uh, you know, come against him and they, they live sinful lives that they don't want God. And can there be people that are living for God at the same time? Do they both have the same, the same difficulty, the same problem to deal with, uh, even though one is righteous and the other is, is not? Yeah. Um, you know, there's God brought judgment on the, uh, you know, Middle East and, but in the middle of it, uh, the famine, it says that Isaac sowed seed in a year of famine and got a hundredfold return. Yes. There's the idea of Jeremiah mm -hmm. that God judged Jerusalem, but, but saved Jeremiah and the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the black eunuch that rescued him out of the, the mucky well. And, uh, there was the, um, uh, you know, Daniel and, and, uh, Babylon and Joseph in Egypt and, the Israelites being provided for. Now, several, several of the plagues were on both the Israelites and the Egyptians. Um, uh, I do think God, God saved Noah, judged the world, but saved Noah and his family in the ark. But, but 
that being said, it's still tough on sure. on the believers when sure. judgment comes. Um, and uh, so it's um, yeah. uh, it, it's a time. But the, the bottom line is that we're responsible for our each person yeah. and, and that liber ever, all liberty is individual, all repentance is individual. Yeah. Return to your first love, return to the word of God, return to praying, find out where he wants you, plug in despise not the day of small beginnings he that's faithful in the very little shall be entrusted with much yes. you trust the lord with uh that your your times are in his hands amen. and um just be busy amen you know you grieve when you see what's going on in the culture you grieve for the children you grieve for the innocent for those that don't really especially the children for me is a real uh it's a real passion point for me because they didn't give the they weren't given the choice adults and people that should know better who, like you said, will end up with a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the lake uh, and end up in the lake of fire if they don't repent and change their ways and go back and help deliver those that they've, uh, they've persecuted and hurt and harmed in the past. But I do see that it's like a tough time to live because you see the pain, you see the pressure, and at the same time you're in the fight and you wanna fight and stop these things. It gives you purpose but uh, it also can give you so much pressure that if you don't turn to the Lord and you don't spend time with God and get refreshed in the spirit, it could weary people. So we do have to keep that first love, keep that relationship vibrant every day with Jesus uh, so that we do go out in, in righteousness. We can be like the Puritans, but we don't get dry. We hear from God and we go out and we do what we can do and know that uh, we can trust God, right? With the results, he's given us, each of us a grace. If we'll all do something, we can change change things in a big way. Okay, I know we got to get off here, but I know you are such a historian and it's very rare I get to talk to someone that can quote, you're like an encyclopedia of history, an encyclopedia of the Bible. I'm just, you're brilliant. My husband said that. So I'm so glad and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm happy to be on any time. I have to ask you one more question. Christmas, what, what historically in America, tell me about Christmas. Uh, well, I wrote a whole book on it, and, and I, I'd be on for another hour if I do. But the title of the book is There Really is a Santa Claus, The History of St. Nicholas and Christmas Holiday Traditions. Uh, if anyone's interested, you can go to my website, AmericanMinute.com, and get it. Uh, but there's a whole lot of rich traditions that we can dig through and, and redeem uh, that uh, I think you'll find fascinating. That's great. And I love your American Minutes. They're phenomenal where you show our history, what happened at that day, the importance, the significance, and you cast a vision for what we can do today based upon what happened in the past. So history is important and we are so grateful. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much uh, for joining me today and we'd love to have you come back again. I, I look forward to it. I look Thank forward you. to it. God Thank bless you. you. God bless Amen. you too. Thank you so much. And I want to encourage you. You got to stay on guard. We're living in all kinds of crazy days, but as Bill has helped us see today, we've had crazy in the past too, whether it be election integrity issues, whatever issues where even back in the Bible days, uh, Israelites giving their children over to Moloch. And so we have to repent ourselves, live our life before God with integrity and speak the truth with love. I'm Drenda. This is Drenda on Guard. Stay in the fight. We'll see you next time. Like, subscribe, and share this with someone else, especially your history buffs and people that uh, are into law and history. They would like to hear, I'm sure, the true history of America. There are a lot of Christians who would tell you, a lot of leaders, a lot of pastors that would tell you, don't talk about certain things. In many ways, the church at large has been outwitted by Satan. We don't wanna be silent about these things. We wanna speak up. It takes courage, it takes boldness, but if we don't address and expose the deeds of darkness, then they take over. We must counter it. We must yep. know our enemy, we must know our adversary, and we must know what his tactics are. We cannot be complacent anymore. You have influence. God has placed you in a sphere of influence. You are a soldier of the light. We need to be straightforward with the truth. Help us to be strong, God. Help us to do our part, Father, to be disciplined, to be ready, to be soldiers of light, soldiers of truth. God, help us to be on guard.